Okay, so you can see up on the screen, the title of this message is What Kind of Love? What Kind of Love? And I, as I was listening to the Lord about this message for today, he could have had me end it. You know, I could have defined right there, but he left that title wide enough for us all to add in some things. So what kind of love? And as we go through this, you can add whatever suffix we're ending to that that you need to. You already heard dot. Like I said, she was all over my message. Um, because, you know, God really has been focusing me on love. Now, I will say, I, I believe it's something that we really need now more and more and more. But I do believe just in the topic, in the title, it will cause the church to go to sleep. You know, because we're the church. If anybody should know about love, it should be the church. And those things that we're so confident on and know that we know, we kind of tune things out. Like, let's say I was going to tell you the scripture for today, the only scripture and the primary scripture is John 3.16. <laughs> you know, now seriously, what happens is in our minds, we say, oh, oh, yeah, got that. I know that scripture. John 3.16, we don't need to do anything else. And in our minds, we kind of close down. Now, maybe that's not you. But just in case that is you, when you hear me say, we're going to talk about love, don't shut down and think, oh, I got this. I can go on and be ready for my lunch. Okay, because God wants me to highlight some different things about um, love and bring some scenarios and more so have us focus on the power of love being displayed. Okay, so hopefully today we're going to take away, walk out of here with the thought of love, and I think of Keith Wasserman every, every time I say this, love is a verb. Keith Wasserman was one of the first people I ever heard, and he would put that on his letter, and he, I used to work for Keith years ago, and he would say that. And so as I was writing this down, I thought, we must be reminded as the church that love is a verb and requires one's deliberate effort to be displayed to the world. Love should not merely be presented to people we like or that hold the same views as we do, but should be shown to all of God's creations. All of God's creation, which means everyone. Sometimes when we think of God's creation, also we think of the church. But no, every single being is God's creation. Amen? So, so that we really put some feet to this, I want us to put some feet to this word we call love. Um, because it's so easy for us to say it. There's times we say it, but we forget to display it. In 1 John 4, and you can turn there if you like. 1 John 4, and I'm going to read verse 7 and 8. Now, I will tell you, I was going to populate this message with a couple of jokes. I decided not to. <laughs> uh, well, since she did that, I'm going to throw one. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm one of those that my comedy comes playing off of a thing. So sometimes it's spur of the moment. So if I put a joke in, I'm really working. Okay, it's like, okay, I'm going to try to script in the joke. That's not normally how it works. So I didn't put any in. Uh, but let's look here in 1 John 4, 7 through 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, I will tell you that some people who just hearing me speak this scripture, it's kind of like, 
blah, 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 blah. What are you saying? Because we, we get into ourselves sometimes when we start talking about love. Because sometimes love, when we talk about it, it means you got to give up something or allow somebody to do something to you and doggone it, I'm just not about that. That's what some of us think. Nobody in here. But remember, we got folks on the airwaves watching this. So I want us to avoid the opportunity to just say, oh, all right, sing around, sit around the corner and sing Kumbaya. You know, <laughs> sit around in a circle and sing Kumbaya. No, there's such a power in our ability to love that is more strong or uh, more awesome than military weapons, more awesome than dynamite, anything you want to put together and you would consider powerful. Love will always be more powerful than anything. Okay? Because in this scripture, it ends with saying, all of, it gives you these Prefer, uh, these, uh, um, these leadings or dis, d these disclaimers, and then it ends with, for God is love. God is love, okay? So first, as, we, as we're looking at this, it says, beloved, let us love one another. And I was looking at that, okay, well, beloved. At the time, he was talking to people who should know better, people who were uh, uh, ones that he had love for. He said, let us love one another. And I start thinking about this. I start to break this down, one another. Is there anybody who's not in the one another? It's not the exclusion of any, right? For love is of God. And everyone, 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 the exclusion of none, who loves is born of God and knows God, okay? He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So sometimes we would look and say, hey, we can stop right here, Otis. We got the love thing down. I know it. But I want to talk about what it looks like. Because see, we talk about rain or uh, the word of God being logos. And if you don't know what logos is, logos is the written word of God. Okay? So you go over to grandma's house or you go over somebody's house and they got the written word of God open on the, the table, the coffee table. Right there sits logos. The full word of God. Right? It's the written word of God. But in order for that written word of God to be beneficial for you in your current situation, something has to illuminate God. The Spirit has to illuminate a portion of that scripture, that Logos word, that is relevant to your situation. Right? And when God comes in and illuminates a certain portion of this, word, the logos, he illuminates it and it becomes something relevant so you can use it. We call that rhema. <clears throat> so there's a lot of people who understand love logos, but it doesn't operate because we don't get down and pull out the rhema of it and say, what does love look like in a given situation? Because understand, our situations are changing. So as I was asking God about this word, I, I kind of wanted, Joy asked me earlier in the week, what's your message going to be? And uh, she was trying to get something to put on the sign. And I'm one of those, I let it marinate and I let several ideas come and God, which one are you telling me about? And so I wasn't really ready. I gave her a couple different ones. But I was trying to get away from the love thing because, like I said, oh, okay, well, can I speak about something deeper? <laughs> or you, can you give me something that's, that's like, uh, okay, let's get into rep. No, no. He said, son, no. <laughs> we need love right now. We need to hear about love more now. 
And it's just not us saying love. Now, I will tell you, I'm not going to go and break down the different levels of love. I want you to assume I'm talking about agape love. So agape love is the God kind of love. It's that love that's not conditional. It doesn't change based on outside forces. Agape love is God's kind of love, and he gives it even when the individual is unworthy. That's the love I'm focusing on. I'm not talking about any of the other loves, which is another message. So as I was doing this and I was listening to God and he, he told me, son, focus on love. And I said, okay, I will focus on love. He said, but I want you to pull out what does love look like in action? Okay. So I said, okay, Father God, let's, let's get into this. What kind of love do we show? And you did that piece about the assessment. I'm telling you, I could have just copied what you said. That we need to do some assessing of ourselves. And am I showing love, agape love, and what it looks like? It is easy for us to love people that we deem worthy. The church is full of people that we love because they know how to get a little two-step going. I don't know. We don't two-step anymore. anymore. <laughs> but they, they believe in speaking in tongues too. They dress appropriately. They say, they call pastor. They, they love the pastor. They pray for the leadership. There's certain things that we have that's the same. And so those folks are easy to love. I love you guys. I'm telling you, I love you. I drive down the road sometimes and just think of you. And I say, how's Susie doing? Boy, I sure miss Bud and Deb. And I, you know what? But even that love is limited because you know what? God said, you think of them and you pray for them, but go. And I'm like, okay, yeah, God, so okay, yeah, I guess. But what I'm saying to you is I love all of you so much, but I know you. I get to hang out with you. I know there's some faces in here I don't see all the time. But what happens when someone comes in or even that I encounter in my life that they're not easy to love? We tell Seth and Jaden, say, you don't have to like everybody, but we do expect you to love everybody. Doesn't mean you're having everybody over for lunch. Just because you love somebody don't mean you're having them over for lunch. But it does mean you should be a warrior for them. You should war for them because God loves them. Okay? Oh, it's hard to stay without going too far. But So anyway, as I was doing this, I was saying, okay, God, well, the pitfall fall that we have when we talk about love, if we don't set it up properly, everybody in the church will just leave and say, yes, of course, we love people. We love people. That's all right. He says, son, deal with the definition and what it looks like, okay? I'll tell you a quick story. When I was working at Cena Care Group Home, and that was Pastor Rob and Tammy, they had started that, and you've heard them talk about Cena Care. I worked there for about two years, and uh, I actually stayed there. I mean, I lived there on the property. And um, I just remember there was this young boy, I won't say the last name, but we would call him Willie. Willie would come, when he would come back to, to the group home, he would come back. Just an ornery little kid, but he would come back. He's, I've been bad, I've been bad, and he would hand me a belt. He would hand us that belt, and I remember one time he just came in the office. I've been bad, I've been bad, okay. And he bent over. And we talked about that, and I said, no, no, Willie, Willie, that's not what's happening. That's not what we're doing. And I remember talking to the pastor about that, and uh, at that time he wasn't my pastor, but we talked about it, and he said that to Willie, you're loving on him when you beat him. I always remember that. That was back in like 88 or 89. Ivy and I got married in 89, and we, I was already working there. 
I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. You came in 89. I never forget dates. I'm sorry. We got married in 91. Listen, listen, just to get me off the hook, August 31st, 91, I never forget that. But we started dating. She came to OU in 89. <laughs> thank you, thank you. She's shaking her head like, and I'm like, oh, I said that wrong. But anyway, that tells you, that's stuck in my head about sometimes what we define as love. There's some people who have been abused repeatedly, but the individual who abused them got them thinking, this is how you display love. So it's not so easy just to say, God is love. Well, yeah, God is love. But we have to separate what does his love look like? And the only way I can figure to do that is to show samples in the Bible where he was loving us. And it left me asking this question, what kind of love? You might ask this question and say, what kind of love am I showing? But for me, I'm going to say, what kind of love is it that you would do this for me, God? That's my perspective. Okay? So if we can turn real quick... To 1 John 4.4, 4. this is just a couple verses before where we were. We were at 7 and 8. And here in verse 4, 1 John 4 and verse 4, you are of God. Little children. And have overcome them. Okay? Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, of course, we heard it over and over and over. That he who is in the world that it speaks of right there is the Antichrist. Okay? And when he says, you are of God... God is love, okay? So if God is love and we are of God, the world who waits for the revealing of the sons of God are waiting to see God revealed in us. So we have to walk about displaying the love of God. And the best way to do that is to take our sample or our example from him, right? So, when we look at different places in the Bible to see how God loved, we're going to, I'm going to just throw out some characteristics of the type of love, and then I'm going to contrast it against us, okay? Love will cause you to act. Love will provoke you to movement. <laughs> Amen. Love will cause you, agape love, will cause you to go beyond yourself and go into someone else's situation. Right? Love will disrupt your agenda. Seriously, I'm, I'm, so as I'm saying these type of things, think about it. What has your love interrupted in your plans? I think about people, I, I hear about folks who, huh, I'm trying to stay away from some things because as I look out, I know your situations uh, and I just want to weep when I think of God's goodness. Um, love will cause you to step up and become a father for someone who's not your own. You might not have planned it, but it's a beautiful thing. Love will cause you to not go to that movie not take that job because you want to be near a loved one who needs your help.
Love will cause a parent to put certain things on hold so that their child will prosper. And even think that those dreams have been passed by only to find out that God is still whispering to you about those dreams. You can get up now, baby. You've done a good job there. Get up and let's go. Love has many ways that it looks or it displays itself. When you become, uh, uh, you're supposed to be a big brother to someone who's a drug addict, but you really start to become daddy. You know, love has different ways of manifesting. What kind of love is this? So in the Bible, we got spots where he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. God gave me that song to think about. Love will cause you to look beyond wrongs. Love will cause you to not try to apply judgment, but love will cause you to bring in mercy. Amen? And so... And this is, uh, I'm not going to go into this scripture, but one of the things, I, uh, this is a, a, a clear example of that would be John 3.16. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? That whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. God doesn't wait around. And sometimes we as, as just people, we say, you know what, I'm not going to talk to that person again until they come correct. I, even if God, and I'm not going to talk to that person again unless they fix that up. Now, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes we know our condition. Okay, that's all right. But when God speaks to you and say, I want you to go bake a pie for her and take that over to her. <laughs> The way they treated me last time, not so. Not so, God. I'm not baking a pie for her. But I'm saying God is love. And he wants us to behave as those who are his. So a dirty pipe with water running through it, I can expect to have dirty water. No way around it. It's false to say, I am God. I am God's property. God is in me, and he is love, and there be a conflict in my behavior. Right? Now, you might be wondering, why am I saying these type of things? Regardless of where we are on what's going on in the world, what position you take, I am not about getting caught up. That's why I appreciated what Eddie said um, uh, about our perspective. We need to have a perspective from God's view, looking down. But I will say, God gives us perspective, but then he expects us to come down from that perspective with relevant information so we can deal in our communities. Okay? He doesn't want us to remain up there and stay outside of the fight. He wants us to bring the correct fight. And as I was asking him about this, I said, God, what is going on? I mean, we got so many things that happen. People would rather videotape someone being beaten than stopping it. Someone would rather videotape an old man being pushed down and keep videotaping instead of picking him up. Someone, even though they were wrong and did something wrong, okay. Did something wrong. Love goes beyond if we're worthy or not. You still don't get to stay on the cat's neck for a certain amount of time. Okay? So, I'm saying, God, what do we have to do? We can't go around saying everybody's racist. We can't go around saying that people don't love other people. 
We can't go around saying, I mean, think about everything that goes on. Sometimes we say, uh, we have all these different things that we say. And regardless of what side you're on on a thing, I say we get on God's side. And if we will love the way he loves, nobody will ever be able to define us by a label. You can take away the labels and just say they are godly people. God-fearing people. Why? Because you might be in a different party, say a different thing, and find me over in your camp on this issue. Because I'm just following truth. And then the next time, there might be another issue over here. And I'm going to be over here on this issue. And you're going to say, I can't get a read on Otis. Where is he at? I can't label him this. I can't label him that. I can't say for sure he's this. I, I mean, what is it? But really, I'm just listening and I'm saying, God, what do you want to do for that? Why, how can I understand this brother? How can I go beyond my situation and understand this brother? How can I go beyond my situation, even hear through the argument and say, what is going on? Listen, everybody that cusses you out is not cussing you out because they hate you. Some people are cussing you out because they hate themselves and they have not dealt with something that's harmed them. And if you will be like Jesus and go beyond just the offense and say, I want to break this thing down. I want to find out what's behind it. That's what love looks like when we're working it. Pharisees were always upset with Jesus. Why are you sitting down with them? Don't you know they tax collect? Why are you sitting with them? Don't you know they, you went in that guy's house. Why did you do that? She's breaking the, uh, she's wasting precious oil on your feet. Why are you letting her do that? And Jesus always had a deeper motivation of love and reaching. You got to contact and reach out to people, right? Because I'm thinking, come thy kingdom, be done thy will on earth as it is in heaven. And I cannot allow God to come in and do what he wants to do unless I allow him to show me how to go beyond Otis. Okay? There's some things that truly need to be addressed. And when I think the fact that he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs, that causes me to understand when I'm working with my children, when I'm working with my wife, and I say, she just don't get it. She don't understand where I'm coming from. Maybe she told me something I didn't agree with, and I think, you know, sometimes there's people who think all kinds of things. It's like we go to the worst place sometimes when we think of someone else. We go to the worst place. And so it makes it hard for us to show love. Keep in mind, love is not going to be contingent or determined by if someone's worthy of it or not. They might not be worthy of it, but the truth is, I'm not either. <laughs> Thank you, God. I'm not worthy of it. Now, so think about this. God gave up his most dear thing, his son, for us. A precious thing that he gave up. Now, at children's services, there are times that people will bring something to uh, children's services as a donation. Now, I kind of hesitate to say this. I know this is being blasted everywhere. Um, we appreciate that. And I'm not speaking for children's services, okay? I'm just giving a situation here. But some people give things and they really give it from their heart. There have been some people who have brought things to children's services that was really trash. That should have just put, been put in the dumpster. But it was able to go, and, uh, you know, they, they were able to be free of that. Now, why do I say anything about that? It is easy to give up something that doesn't mean anything. It's easy. I got six donuts. Sure, you can have two. 
I'm on my last one. Uh, babe, you can run down to the McHappy's. No. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> I would give it to her. I would give it to her. When something's precious or rare, that's when it's hard to give up. Now, I'm going to tell you, um, there's, there's times that I've seen people, I'm one of those people that forgive too quickly. Well, no, I won't say too quickly. I forgive faster than what some people think I should. Okay? Because, fine, you tell me sorry, you say, hey, and even if you don't tell me sorry, I'm moving on. That's just me. And I've been criticized about that in times past. But I truly believe that power belongs to the one who is able to love and forgive. And so I'm not looking to get you back. I'm not trying to hold a grudge and get you back. But what the devil wants to do, where God wants us to operate out of love, because love is like having gas in your car. This whole thing operates off of love. If you don't have love, you're going to stall. It's gonna, you're not going to be able to move it. Okay? So what the devil does is he comes in. <laughs> hey, you know that Darren, you both are bald-headed, but I think Darren's head is a little smoother than yours. And your little pitly goatee is so small compared to his beard. It's, he's a real man. I start letting mine grow out. Ivy says, I don't like it. Well, I'm going to have it. I'm the man of this house. The devil starts trouble is what I'm telling you. Now I'm thinking, oh, I got to have a bigger beard like, like Darren. And I'm shaving my head every two minutes. And meanwhile, driving my wife crazy because she doesn't like this big beard that I have or something. That's a silly example. But what I'm trying to tell you is because God says he wants us operating in love, which means showing love to each other, the devil says, I can't have y'all getting unified in this love thing. I need to put something between you that will cause you to always be suspect of what their motivation is. Uh, something that will always cause you to say, I'm not sure about that dot and what she's up to. And so you'll question the people we're supposed to be loving on. And I will even put it a little bit further. Even when someone does have ill intentions, we are supposed to be wise of it, but still love them. But still love them. Amen? All right. Also, when I think about what kind of love, it's the type of love that will substitute his position for mine. Which means it takes sacrifice. I cannot tell you how many times I've gone to hospitals, prayed for people, laid hands on people. There's been times God had me move in healing ministry. I've been able to lay hands on people and see them get up. And I remember on all of those situations, I found myself just saying, Lord, just, I mean, really wanting it to work out for them. Almost to the degree where I'm like, I can fight this battle if it was on me. <laughs> now, that sounds cocky, but, you know, you try to take their place. I'm the type that I want to relieve you from any pain if I can. Anything I can pull off of you, if I can do it, I want to do it. But that's because I love like that. Because I hate to see people go through hardships. And I know you're probably the same. But in 1 John 4.10, it says, In this love, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. That was 1 John 4.10. God being, or uh, that his son to be the propitiation or the, uh, the appeasement, you could say. There was a requirement that was on us 
to fulfill by the law. And we could not fill, fulfill the law. We know this. We know this. It's elementary. But what Jesus did, God sending Jesus in our place caused everything to be settled to say, okay, you've met all the, all the agreements we had that were broken. You've met those and now it's okay. Right? But understand, and a lot of, I heard Miles Davis, or Miles Davis, Miles Monroe, awesome pastor who passed away several years ago, he really highlighted something about Jesus for, for me. I heard him do this message. A lot of times we think about Jesus having been the word, becoming flesh, walking amongst us, and then dying and being raised again. But something he highlighted, and he said, you realize that Jesus will never again be in his original state that he was designed to be in because of him coming down for us. And that kind of sh shakes my thinking for a moment because he, eternity, for eternity altered his original state so that he could become flesh, come down here, deal with this thing and get this yoke up off of us. Get this yoke up off of us. And so when you think about the level of sacrifice, and here we won't give up a pizza. God says, turn down a plate. Just fast a day. Fast your time even. <laughs> I want you to take two hours and 40 minutes and just focus on me. And we are still so busy at times that we don't do that. Now, listen, I'm not bringing condemnation. I'm talking to myself. There's stuff that I have to say to myself. And I, I'm like, can't you offer that? That's the least you can do. Right? This Jesus loved so much that he said, look, I'm going to get in your place. And I'm going to take this on myself. And again, it's not because you're worthy. So as you think about the things you endure in your life, I don't care if it's what you're doing at work. I don't care if somebody got promoted ahead of you. Maybe you didn't get the raise you thought you were uh, due. Maybe your children are acting a fool and uh, just not doing what they need to do. And you might even be at that point where you say, you know, I am just done with this. I'm done with it. Maybe your family or your parent isn't, uh, uh, you, you and your parent don't get along and you think you're right, they think they're right, and you stay separated all this time. We got to go beyond that. The devil wants you separated. He doesn't want you talking to each other. He doesn't want you showing love to each other. Because if you show love to each other, imagine if the person you're not talking to is the very person God put a seed in for you. And so you keep them away because of, of an offense. They did something that was wrong. And God says, I need you to get beyond that. The devil loves it. He, sp he spurs it on. He said, like, stay as separate as possible. Because if you get hold of, they, I know you don't like them, but believe it or not, they're going to tell you what you need to hear. That's going to set you on the right track. It is true. It does happen. I'm going to tell you something. When my father was fighting cancer, I would, wow, I had so many people pour out love and give us cloths and people gave us special anointing oil. Um, I mean, it was just amazing. And I remember looking at my dad. It was near the end. And wow, he held on. This is what allowed him to leave. It's amazing that a parent who is dealing with losing his own life thought of these things up to his very last moment. I told him, I said, Dad, listen, we're going to take good care of Mom. 
We're going to take care of mom. We're going to take care of this place. She's always going to have a home. She's always going to have a place. We're going to take care of her. We're all right. Now, when I said those things to him, he died within four hours of that, four to five hours of that. He died in the middle of the night with my mother. I went away. I was asleep, but my mom was with him, and she said to me that one of the things he said right before the end was, well, we did pretty good with those kids, didn't we? We did pretty good with those kids. I had no children at that point. My father died June 2nd, 2004. Seth was born June 24th the same month. Now, Seth came into our lives in October, but I was an emotional fool with Seth because I finally understood the love my father had for me. I never knew it. I thought he just didn't like me at times. I mean, I knew he loved me, but and he would show some affection. But A lot of times he was hard on us. (laughs) And I did not understand how much he loved us until my mom and that, that exchange I had when he was fighting cancer. I'm telling you this to tell you that sometimes your definition of love gets adjusted so that even hurting someone while you love them because it's the best thing for them, still can take place. Now that sounds weird, but if Taylor broke her leg, and if Tony was the only one around to help her, Tony is going to probably have to cause her some pain and some hurt. But the love that she has for her is going to override her just saying, I don't want to see her in pain, I'm going to ignore it. No, I'm going to pop her leg back where it needs to, because that's what we need to do for right now to get to the next stage. And that's how God is. Right? Doesn't God do that with us? Everybody see the lamb around uh, Jesus' neck? The lamb around Jesus' neck and you're like, oh, that's so sweet. That lamb has to be carried because that lamb kept straying away. That lamb did not stay where it was supposed to stay and so that thing kept going away. And so what would happen is the shepherd would have to take that thing, boom, break its leg. And now that that thing's leg is broken, he puts it around his shoulder. So everywhere they go, that thing has to rely on him. When it's time to eat, he takes the lamb off, give him something to drink, get him some food. When it's time to move, he can't move. Picks him back up, puts him on his shoulder. And it's like, wow, if God loves you, why would he do that to you? Because he loves you on the long game. God loves you for the long game. He doesn't mind you crying a little bit. He'll tell you no. And you'll think, oh, this is so cruel. He'll let you go through some things, but he still got you. That's the type of God we serve. Another thing is, so that I don't get too long. Oh, wow. He steps out of his busy schedule and adopts our cause. It's a powerful thing when someone else's cause becomes yours. It's a very powerful thing because what we are are sowers. We're farmers. All of us are farmers. And when we sow, we reap. It comes back to us. Now, I'm going to go to this story in Luke 10, which you guys all know the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to read this piece in Luke 10, verse 25 through 37. I want to highlight just a couple things here. Again, I'm saying, what kind of love would do these things? The type of love that I want to display for others. That means I'm going to interrupt my agenda. I need to take time out. I need to go see you. If you're on my mind, it's okay to pray, but I will tell you, a lot of people laugh at the church when we say pray. I'll pray for you because be truthful. A lot of times what we're saying is, I'll give the least effort I have. 
Not because prayer is not powerful, people. Don't get me wrong. Prayer is the most powerful thing we can do. But a lot of times the world looks at you and you, we say, I'll pray. Okay. They say, can you also like buy somebody some food? Now, I know we do this. So at Bethel, but seriously, there's times that we forget to go and visit. We don't go to the prison, visit those who are supposed to visit, you know? Not as frequent. And I'm not talking about the organization of the church. I'm talking about us as Christians. Okay? Because it's bigger than that. Your, your organized church might do that. But us as individuals, do we link up with these type of services that we should be doing based on our love? Okay? We've got to put some feet to it. Uh, here in Luke, Luke 10 starting in verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested, tested him, saying, tested Jesus, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is, what is your reading of it? What's your take on it, basically? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Also love your neighbor as yourself. 28, and he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Remember what I said about love being like gas in your car? If you forget to put gas in, it just halts. That's what he's saying. Do this and you will live. You cannot fully operate the way we need to without being loving of first God and of our neighbor. 25, well, I'm sorry, 29. But he wanted to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man, I love that about Jesus, you know, in the Jewish culture, they, their intellect and their study was so strong that instead of just giving an answer, they would ask another question that revealed that they had even deeper understanding. And that's what Jesus did, just did to this. He didn't even try to answer the guy. But he wanted to be justified, said to him, and who was my neighbor? Because this guy, who's a Jew, also said the same thing. He also asked a question to show how deep he is. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down to Jerusalem, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, now by chance, a certain priest came down the road. And when he saw him, so understand, can't say you didn't see him. When he saw this man, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked. He got an eyeball on it and passed by on the other side. Both seen and both passing by. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured, pouring in oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. 35, on the next day, when he departed, he took two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Now, remember earlier I said, uh, you know, having love in your heart will cause you to act. And even though the individual, and this is agape love, it's not, any, it's not a romantic love or anything, it's agape love, so it's not conditional. 
but it will cause you to do action. And it has nothing to do with the outside forces, if they're good or bad, should they, do they deserve it or not? It's all, it's, it's in you to do because God is love. But what it will cause you to do is bring in mercy. Okay. And that's exactly the one who showed him mercy was his neighbor. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. You go and do the same type of stuff that this parable just identified for you. So just real quick, a couple things. On the front end of this in 25 there, it talked about two commandments being the greatest. Love God. Can't get around it. That's number one. Love God. Love your neighbor. And you guys all know scriptures where it talks about how can you say you love God who you don't see, but you don't love uh, this person that you do see. Right? So I don't even have to get into all of that. But the truth of the matter is we are lying if we say we love God, but we don't love what God loves. It's incomplete. These two are the most important. They control all the other commandments. You can satisfy the other commandments by these two. All right. But now notice, Jericho, Jericho is the second city of Judea. That is the home for the priests and the Levites. So, they would have been walking from their service in the temple, their temple duties. They would have been coming about. Now understand, I was telling, oh yeah, in our prophetic class, I was saying it is very possible to do a good thing and it be sin. Okay? So, and what I was telling the group is this. If you do anything that's outside of the will of God, let's say God has a different purpose for you. God says, I want you to do this thing over here. And you go over here and do A, B, and C. A, B, and C could really be good things, but doesn't mean they're God things, okay, for you. So it is possible to do something that is good, but be sinful at the same time. Because it would be contrary to what God told you to do. All right? I want to make sure we're clear on that. So here you have these Levites who were so, the Levite, and you have the priest. He is so focused on their ministry and the duties that they have, and they just completed some things. I'm not going to say I know what they were thinking. Was it, they, we did such a good job. I'm tired. I want to go home, whatever. I got to get home, take care of the family. I don't know what the reasons were. But I will tell you, in them having done their duty, their duty was bigger than just the confines of the temple. Right? These two, who should know better, came along their way and found someone who was beaten and down on this situation and in a ditch. They came and looked, they saw, and passed on the other side. Both of them. Now, and without getting into this, uh, all the scripture of it, there are scripture out there that talks about even if you come across someone who, who's had their animal fall in the ditch, it could be a friend, it could be an enemy, it could be someone, uh, it could be a brother in Christ, it doesn't matter. But when you find them in the ditch, even the animal, you are to help get that thing out. They didn't even give this guy that same courtesy. They moved on. Now you come to the Samaritan. The funny thing about Samaritans, now understand, the one who was beaten by the thief was a Jew. The Samaritans were excommunicated by the Jews. Okay? So, uh, the ex, when you think about that, they were of the same level of like being a heretic or being a devil. They were just outcast, not right, something's wrong, evil. 
That's what they would have thought. Jews would have thought that of Samaritans. And we see other areas, uh, other stories in the Bible where that proves out. But here in this situation, the Samaritan, it said, had compassion. The outcast had compassion. But those who knew God, worked in the temple, worked in the church, did not show compassion. They moved on the other side. So, understand, this guy here gave his funds, the Samaritan, gave his time, put the guy on his own beast, and walked. Not only that, he co-signed for him later, because he told the innkeeper, look, I know I gave you enough money for now, but if there's something that I'm missing, I'm co-signing for his cost. He went beyond himself, and yet he was despised of the very being that he was helping. Of that very race that he was supposed to be helping. He was despised. So what am I saying to you? If we allow outside forces to affect us, the love that we show to each other, we wouldn't be doing that. If I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew and I'm going to hold to those things and, and I know, oh, I'm an untouchable for you, I'm not going to go beyond where I, sh where I am. I'm not going to show you love. But God is bigger than our situation. There's a lot of craziness happening in our world. And if we are going to be victorious, we, Bethel, and the church as a whole, is going to have to communicate honestly, open our ears, and not be offended. Because I'm going to tell you, if somebody says something to me that's wrong, I want to find out why first. I want to find out why. You know? I remember I was doing a youth group. Yeah, I do need to go, don't I? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to end this thing, guys. I know you're tired. I've got about another 30 minutes and I'm done. <laughs> All right. So, listen. I was doing this youth group once, and in this youth group, a boy let out the F word. Everybody looked at me like, I said, guys, chill. His F word is not going to kill us. I mean, he might not be churched. I'm happy he's in the group. I can teach that out of him. <laughs> and so all I'm saying to us is as we go beyond and, and remember, question ourselves, do what Dot was saying is look and see what type of love are we showing to each other. If we do that, we the church will be able to lead the world. We will be able to lead the world. God wants us to take our rightful place. This is our place to be running. The church but that means we're going to have to go beyond ourselves and do the Jesus and love each other. Work through it, and we need to be victorious. Amen? All right. Well, listen, that's all I've got. I know I went a little long. Let's pray. You can throw on a tape. And, oh, a tape. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> throw on a recording. <laughs> all right. Listen. I love you guys. Next week, you're going to have Brother Eddie. And I know Brother Eddie, Pastor Eddie, always brings a good word. I appreciate him. And uh, so come ready to hear and um, have a good time. Amen. I'm going to pray for you right now. And remember, at the end of this, if there's uh, some other prayers that you need, you've got an opportunity to come up front. Father God, we just thank you for this. We thank you for this time we had together. We thank you that you're a loving God. And you're going to show us how to put feet to the, that love every day, Father God, going forward. We appreciate you so much. Now, as we go home, Father God, let us have a great day of fellowship and love on our family and a good meal. Father God, whatever it is, let us be safe. Keep us whole in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.